Good evening. I'm happy to be here. My apologies for speaking in English. It's because I am English. <laughs> I'll go fast with many images. I will highlight a tough challenge, one faced by all mature cities that have returned to growth, that are fast repopularizing. Good cities have everything. They are inclusive and welcoming. As the demand for space intensifies, how do we embrace a fully mixed economy, allow its presence in the city, care about its configuration and visibility? How do we invent and deliver the accommodation needed my grandfather's warehouse coat, made in a small workroom, he and his brothers ran behind one of their shops in Gorton, inner Manchester, near where he lived with family close to the factories in which he learnt and the urban roller coaster on which he rode. That warehouse coat says much to me about the economy as what we all do together, voluntarily. The economy is an everyday thing, familiar. I hear that coat saying much also about the kind of city we want, a place of collaboration and possibility. That kind of city can't be taken for granted. It will not just fall into our laps, there is much pressure that could pull us elsewhere. We must speak up for it, work for and defend it, manoeuvre and design for it. A few years ago, I spent time in a big Dutch new town that's doing very well, very neat, green, an odd place though, in a way we've all seen before. Something seems to be missing, hidden away. It's the economy, pushed beyond the trees, out of view. The office blocks and the industry are on their own, landscaped and screened. The schools and colleges, the healthcare buildings, lurk around the back on quiet suburban roads. The shops and community centers, the places to get a meal or a drink, are in little precincts that you go to when you need to, only then. It feels like that town turned out the way it did because people were thinking of the economy as something others do for you or to you, that it's okay for it to be over there, not here, and there is no need to, for it to be embraced and celebrated. We don't want our cities to become like Almere, nice though it is, Cities should host economic diversity, meet the needs of enterprise, allow it a public presence. They should welcome and accommodate. That Dutch planned place would have been emerging from the soil during the years that I first experienced London in the 70s. I came from the suburban south of Manchester further out than Gorton, an area then fast adjusting itself to the pace and scale of the car. And to me, London felt like a surprisingly old-fashioned city. I found a place, in fact, like that, captivatingly described by my grandfather, the man with the warehouse coat. This city showed itself to the world with its economy and public life visible to all the joyful opposite of the car-based and fractured urbanism of the outer Manchester suburbs and the instant Dutch version. What I was seeing when I arrived in London was a city of high streets, a city with 
industry and commerce weaved in and nearby with an embedded and varied economy, an extrovert and available city. That now feels very relevant, optimistic. It had seemed like the past, but now it feels similar to the future we might choose. Excellent. But there are some bumps in the road ahead, I think. My biggest focus is London, where I live, where I spend much of my time, in fact, running a small factory. Here it is, 10 people. Been going for 71 years. We make trays near London's Old Kent Road. I believe that what London is these days experiencing has lessons for other European cities like this one. Warnings as well as encouragements. You may, some of you, be familiar with my city. If you are, you will know that this is a typical street scene. <laughs> it's a fast-growing and freewheeling place. In fact, those red uniforms, it so happens, are all made in Tottenham, North London, by a wonderful business who now expect to be pushed out of their home. One of the thousands of victims of a strip out of the space needed to house a burgeoning, super diverse economy and a failure to build new. We are in the midst in London of a flourish, a refreshing of urban vitality, but at the same time, a fast and grim demixing. I will tell you a little bit about what that process threatens. Suggest that inventive response is now our greatest urban project. Pick an area then. Let's look along the Thames from hovering above Raynham. Hiding in there are huge material yards, stockholders, builders, merchants, by the dozen, timber yards, recycling plants. In the distance, you'll spot it, Britvic, who make Pepsi for London to drink, Tate and Lyle Sugar, the vegetable oil refinery in Erith, the gold ingot manufacturers, taps and magnets. Skip hire, waste transfer, wharves, rail freight, warehouses, businesses working with metal, glass, paper, plastic, power, water treatment, packers and shippers, Ford's diesel engine plant in Dagenham, London's biggest factory, makes over a million engines each year. Lots of windows, doors, kitchens and wardrobes, foundries and fabricators, metal spinners, turners, millers, punchers, Tilda Rice, the wax people, laboratory glassware, helicopter parts, extruding, plating and coating, salmon smoking, Whitaker and Sawyer and Mason Pearson making brushes, the pallet people, the makers of garden sheds, ice cream wafers. A few kilometers to the north, in Tottenham, near that dress uniform factory, the car repairers cluster, tucked behind High Road, a classic piece of everyday London in a part of town rich in many ordinary ways, even though battered and short on prosperity, gathered around the old enfilade of high streets, alongside the shops and cafes. There's a library, a town hall, swimming pool and gyms, police station, advice places, easy access office spaces, all mixed with the housing. Around the back, with those vehicle menders, is a high-quality wholesale bakery, a small brewery and a big new Sainsbury's supermarket. Over to the east, a short walk away in the industrial areas, there's a workshop that makes light fittings, 
the Gina Shoe Factory, the big pita bakeries, the artist studios, the printers, joiners, and metal workers, cash and carries, and trade showrooms. There are plenty of places to worship, to hear and make music, to pay pool. There are pubs and clubs, schools, banks, a couple of markets, and haircuts to be had, many haircuts. It is a locality with plenty of problems, where riots flared up some years ago. Been a few nasty murders last week there. But it is also a superb host, configured in a way that you could only plan in your dreams. It is the gathering of city life around a multi-mixed street, part of a wider metropolitan matrix. And in the depth, behind and beyond working places, it reminds us how to arrange a city such as we want. Settings of this type are a key part of London's brilliance. Taken together, London's high streets, like Tottenham, are a vast phenomenon, 600 of them. Put them end to end and they would thrive on for about 500 kilometers, three weeks to walk it. If you kept your pace up and each step of the way, you would pass vibrant and visible enterprises. Sometimes rough, struggling, battered, and as often prosperous, sparkling, improving. Here's Fiona Scott's amazing revelation drawings, the used car showrooms in carved out houses, the Rabbit Warren Market Hall, Aldi and Lidl's, McDonald's, the crusts and the backs, the churches, mosques, gyms and garages, the frontage and the depth, the conceived and the ad hoc. Some parts are thin, that shallow crust, but elsewhere the people filled ways fold and loop along side streets, rear streets, arcades and malls, big lobbies and foyers, then yards, estates, multi-user buildings. It's where my city is most effervescent and available. But these places are under-recognized, vulnerable. We are lucky, as if by magic, the city configuration that seemed most appropriate, seem most appropriate for this century's version of the future, are already there, available for us to shape. Now we understand that there is this chance to make a city of continuities and mix, a city that can broadly welcome. But there's the strip out problem, difficult. Our luck is running out. Yes, there's a great deal of embedded economy and civic life in my city and the prospects are good. It's growing from within. High streets are flourishing once again after decades in the doldrums, wanting to lengthen and deepen industrial workshop and studio space is sought after, but all is not well. Competition for space is intense. Housing growth is taking out capacity for a flexible, everyday economy. Right across the city, right to its edges, we are seeing fast shrinkage of non-residential accommodation, a forced consolidation just as demand intensifies. After half a century of decline, London has returned to rapid growth. The city is re-aggregating, burgeoning at the same pace as during its 19th century race ahead. Meanwhile, we sustain strong constraint of land supply. The green belt, Ebenezer Howard's green girdle, appropriately named, holds the city in, 
This is what magnifies the tensions, the difficult, now familiar side effects, the fitting it all in challenge, we call it, but we are failing that challenge. Worst and fastest affected is industry. One seventh of London's jobs, that's about half a million, but treated with contempt and getting a kicking. So I've been giving that attention over the past few years, the process of failure to fit it all in is rough, often aggressive. Three years ago, archway sheet metal were arson attacked. It interrupted the work of these 25 people, also in Tottenham, manufacturing catering equipment just behind the high road. The Redneck Football Club and local government want to strip out that high street, compact it, remove the workshops and the worship around the back, evict the people and the businesses, replace with housing, just housing. Archway sheet metal had their factory expropriated by the local government. Like many others, they did not know what to do next. Barbara Wilson, nearby in Wood Green, one of the hundreds of other businesses that can expect to be pushed aside in that part of London, manufacturing brassware and water fittings for over 100 years, but now threatened by redevelopment plans. Our local governments, sadly, in London, are encouraging the market to do what it wants to do, replace great swathes with pure housing. They have not understood the challenge. London is eating itself. That's not good. The city is growing at such a pace with such tight constraint of land supply that conflict between uses has heightened. In this constricted city, housing is taking out the ability to welcome. The phenomenon has never before been experienced citywide. While the spreading center looks set to retain its remarkable economic depth, the rest of London is suburbanizing. As it intensifies its housing, its economy is being forced to narrow to just what is there to serve the nearby domestic population. Space for the full range of non-residential uses is being lost. Opportunities are being curtailed. Parts of the economy are starting to migrate away since the economy can always respond to pressures more readily than the stock of buildings. We are seeing a shrinking of chances, mismatch between the city's dynamic and its physical fabric. My city then is hemorrhaging. It's hemorrhaging lower order office space. One third of our small unit studio and workroom extent is reckoned to be endangered. Shortage are already pushing out occupants. Over two years, the outer London boroughs lost 14% of their office space to residential. Two thirds of that was occupied, displacing over 40,000 jobs. Builders, merchants, and music promoters complain there is nowhere. Places of worship scour the city for a home, as do recyclers, equipment hirers, food preparers, printers, joiners, metal fabricators, logistics companies shout that they want to be within the M25, the orbital motorway, and many of them need to be close to the center, but the space is not there. High streets are struggling to give a home to all the worlds that are looking for one. Try to find space and you'll find it tough. In my part of town, the local government is targeting an industrial economy that provides work to 5,000 people, 
They want us to go away. My factory is one of those to be erased, of course. We are fighting. We are telling the world what we do, where we are, why we have a valid claim, but we are weak and they are strong. Across London, industrial space is being squeezed the fastest. In 14 years, the whole city has lost 16% of its industrial footprint. We have gone from flood to drought. We are heading for an industrial accommodation deficiency of about 700 hectares. That could make more than 10% of our city's industrial economy homeless, a threat to 50,000 jobs. And the pipeline of future loss keeps expanding. Huge swathes are being grabbed for suburbanization. Meanwhile, the filigree of small workshop spaces in residential areas and high street settings are being feverishly removed. While the whole city is so robust that the averaged picture may not look the worse, the total London economy may continue to grow strongly, the finer grained outcome could be a denuded three quarters of the city's area with reduced capacity for entrepreneurialism and shared life, this would, of course, be a tragedy and a big problem. With echoes of Jane Jacobs, that was over 50 years ago, we must speak up again for the urban, for the filigree and diverse, for the potential of the already there. We must observe and reveal, then describe the city we want and devise the means to shape it. Now that's a big task. We must invent the key message, the big challenge. It is our job together to shape the cities we want, to make sure we can welcome the full dynamic, allow all to be where they want to be, accommodate a full economic and civic life, figure out how to embrace that life, Weave it in as cities continue to repopularize, get more intense. London, of course, is not alone. Our challenges repeat elsewhere. We are working in parallel with fragmentary explorations in many other cities. Action on the ground, experiments in development starting to emerge. Rotterdam, Basel, Antwerp, Brussels, New York, Munich, Vancouver, Berlin too, I hope. With a bit of luck, we here, I'm guessing, can all agree that we want a mixed city, multifunctional localities, everywhere productive. That's an increasingly popular view. Yet we have a type challenge. How to achieve not just greater density, but more cohabitation, more depth in the accommodation. Why can't we intermingle? Why can't we embed? We should, we need to. The job includes hunting for examples. Here's suburban depth in Stanmore, humble shop and factory in Leighton, marquees they make, metal workers in a housing block in Vienna, and occasionally new like this spontaneous development in the used car export area of Brussels, residential above a huge yard entrance. And as London grows, we look at the developments that could so easily incorporate more mix, welcome in the bigger spaces we need, but currently do not. Here, near my own factory, a large housing development has big span spaces for a school, but that could just as well have been a factory or a courier depot or a taxi repair workshop underneath the housing. And so too could this big garden shop in Vienna embarking 
In East London, there is a huge new supermarket with housing above. The big lorries and the yard and the noisy air extractors are all incorporated into the building designed in. If that's possible, then why not food producers, makers, urban logistics, as we so desperately need? Recently finished near King's Cross, this large builder's merchants with student living above. Meanwhile, in Munich, they're building Gewerbehof, multi-story workshop buildings to house businesses priced out of other accommodation in the city, recognizing the need. In Hamburg, near the middle of the city, plans are emerging for multi-story industrial and workshop accommodation. In Vancouver, just 15 minutes walk east of the center, this development is going up. It will combine 350 flats with 1,200 square meters of offices on top of two levels, containing 6,000 square meters of industrial. Our students at the CAS, where I sometimes teach, have been exploring how it can be done. Other students are exploring. The topic, thank goodness, is now in play, residential with industrial, where the alternative would be just housing. Here, testing by our friends at Karakusevich Carson Architects, industry and housing together, an alternative plan for part of Tottenham. Here, an aggregate wharf with residential. It doesn't get much bolder than that, soon to be built by the Thames, we hope. A few first steps these are, but we still have a big mountain to climb. Brussels has been a second focus for me over the past couple of years. So as I finish, a taster of that then. A process has been rolling with much support, support from the Flemish and Brussels governments exploring practically how to welcome a broad mix into that city as it evolves. They asked me to be an ongoing atelier mister, I like the title. Design teams have been working on real cases, testing, building, and development types. Through a series of sessions, building interest, sharing, here for example at Bozar in Brussels and here at Ferma, a new open workshop in industrial Buda. We are busy getting a better understanding of what industrious Brussels and around is like, reflecting on how it, how it chimes with elsewhere. Like all cities, vehicle repair, for example, is a pervasive presence here in London, Naples, Rotterdam, beautifully tucked below housing. So too in Brussels, car servicing, van repair, a big car parts world and car trading, a remarkable dynamic. Tuning our admiration for how the economy currently weaves in to the city fabric, Buda, Hevart, Schalbeek, the Axo Nobel factory, Masui, the superb new recycling place stitched in the Leonidas warehouse. Breathtaking integration of the Godiva factory into a super varied block. Here also doing the audit that no one had attempted, getting to grips with what goes on and where right across Brussels. On show at the Rotterdam Architecture Biennale was some of the explorations a few facts to help the argument about the value of embracing mix. No longer pushing away, we showed the first outcomes of what the architects were doing. It's all about igniting the conversation, the thinking. Another show more recently in Brussels, 
and the political support is growing and the real projects are brewing. In fact, they now plan their very own Gewerbehof. My main point has been a simple one. To have the cities we want, accommodating and multi-mixed with diverse, self-driving economies through the current century will be a big project, a demanding and complex one. To meet that challenge, we will need to look with care at what we already have. The lucky finds understand the vulnerability and we need to evolve types as we intensify, build in depth, a richness of accommodation, fabric able to welcome. This is a collective design challenge, how to mix fulsomely. A lot is at stake. We must be inventive. You all here in Berlin must be invented inventive, because now is that time. Yes, cities with everything are possible, even as they grow. We have to make it happen. And thank you for so patiently listening to me.